Hello, Ludwig van Beethoven is one of the greatest composers, is often considered the greatest, a defining figure in Western classical music. He was born in Bonn in 1770 and moved to Vienna, the hub of European music in his early 20s, and there he flourished. Yet, still in his 20s, he noticed he was losing his hearing and had to find a way to keep going, to create even greater works rather than give up. His output loomed over the rest of the 19th century as it does today. In particular, he popularised music without words, transcending language, and he changed the way that audiences valued music, making it something that could be engaged with and thought about rather than played in the background and talked over. With me to discuss Beethoven are Laura Tunbridge, Professor of Music and Henfrey Fellows in Catherine's College, University of Oxford, John Dethridge, Emeritus King Edward Professor of Music at King's College London, and Erica Bruman, Bruman, Senior Lecturer in Music, Canterbury Christchurch University. So here we go, Beethoven without the music. John Dethridge, what signs were there in Bonn that Beethoven might become a composer? Uh, there are plenty of signs. Uh, he was there from uh, 1770 to 1792, 22 years in a very active musical place um, and met a very great number of interesting people, including a composer you've never heard of now called Christoph Gottlob Nefer, who came as a quite well-known composer, but very well-read composer, open to French ideas about social reform enlightened absolutism but the most important thing about his main teacher was that he had a connection to the Bach tradition he was taught by someone called Hiller and um, he knew CPE Bach the son of JS Bach and he gave Beethoven a manuscript copy of the 48 when he was only 13 years old and Beethoven studied this for its harmony at a very early age now that's something that Mozart and Haydn didn't have the privilege of doing. So there was a combination of things with Beethoven's upbringing. First of all, this training in the North German Bach tradition, and secondly, this exposure to progressive ideas coming from France, which were particularly uh, particularly uh, controversial and talked about in this area of Germany. Getting a little bit behind, or a little bit before that, uh, John, his grandfather had been a musician at the court in Bonn, uh, reasonably good, I get from the, from the notes that all of you have given. His father was not as good a musician, but was also a drunk and uh, was determined that his boy uh, should become another Mozart, who was a few years ahead of him. That might be exaggerated. I think the important thing about the grandfather, he had the same name, Ludwig van Beethoven. He was also quite well off, so he left the family in well, quite... Just a second. He was a musician, though. He was, was a musician, yeah. He was, head of mu he was head of music in Bonn, so yeah. I'm going too fast. And his... his his son, um, he didn't like his son particularly much. He used to call him Johannes der Läufer, which means uh, Johannes the, the runaway, a play on words in German from John the Baptist. And he was never at home, but he did teach his son, our Ludwig van Beethoven, apparently too strictly, though. Beethoven said later he didn't allow me to improvise. So he owes his father some of the basics, but he didn't actually get his real idea of what was to come from him. He got it from Christoph Gottlob Neve, a particular attitude to composition. Nevertheless, his father drove him. His father made his him, father him drove lots him of indeed. His father made him practice till midnight a lot of nights, and his father wanted him to be the new Mozart. So we have that pressure on him and that idea, that goal as a young boy. And then he, of course, he made him Mozart. cry. Yeah, Mozart too strict, was one yes. of his great heroes, and he hoped to meet him. There's, there's a controversy about whether you don't not meet him. We might enter into that. But how well placed was Bonn? But Bonn was very well placed. It was um, uh, inside one of these ecclesiastical states, alongside the Rhine. Uh, with, the Col with Cologne as its centre, the other two had Trier and Mainz as their centres, and this was a very active part of the Holy Roman Empire. But the important thing, as I've said, it had lines of communication to Amsterdam, an important publishing centre, and to Paris. And French was actually the second language there, which is, which is where Beethoven picked up. Uh, uh, French, uh, the French language. He could never speak it that well or write it, but he certainly knew French. And Tocqueville always used to say that this part of Germany, the great historian of the French Revolution, that this part of Germany, unlike any other part of Germany, was the one most receptive to French ideas because of this problematic relationship between the aristocracy and the peasantry. So Beethoven was in the thick of it right from the start. When you're talking about French ideas, you're talking about, you're talking about the end of the 18th century, revolutionary ideas, ideas yes. yes. Yeah. Enlightenment, social reform, revolutionary yes. ideas. Yes, very good. Laura, uh, 
And what made me, he went to Vienna when he was about 20. Why did he go and why was it so important for musicians to go there? Well, this is the next stage of his education in some ways. He went to study with Haydn. And in so doing, he managed to establish himself within the Viennese classical tradition. So from that point of view, this was the next step on from what he'd already taken on from his family and from the musicians he encountered in Bonn. Vienna was also going to be a very important place for him as a musical city, partly because it has his already an idea of an incipient musical tradition of Mozart, Haydn, and then Beethoven would insert himself into that legacy or be inserted into it. But also it's just a hugely musically diverse city. And I think this is something that we forget, that it's not just about the Viennese classical tradition, but also about Italian opera, French opera, um, dance music, entertainment, the idea that the Viennese like to have a good time within musical circles. And so it's an incredibly rich environment for Beethoven to enter into. What did he do when he got there? He was studying, he was beginning to teach, um, he was also performing. And was he st- who was, was he being helped? Was, John, was, was he studying with someone? Well, studying with Haydn, as Already, I said. Already, as soon said. as he got there. Yeah, they'd made the connection in Bonn, and then Beethoven agreed on the understanding that he could then travel on to London, perhaps with Haydn, although that never came to fruition. Mm. So he was studying and playing and making and making a living? Yes, he was. And in fact, although it was a little bit tight for him in terms of managing to dress himself adequately and find accommodation and all of that, he was actually able to support himself and found it a reasonably good living. Was he among a lot of other young men who were thinking that there was glory in Vienna? And was he one of many or did he stand out already by the time he got there? What, what, was, what was it like for him when he was 20, 22, that sort of thing? I think at first, actually, he was quite willing to play a part in society and be part of the young men, the brilliant musicians who were around in Vienna. Of course, it's also an important place for musicians to visit and to pass through. Um, I think the other thing that happens, um, perhaps is that he's able to start to compete with other performers to make his name as an improviser. And so that's also an important way in which he establishes his reputation. And of course, increasingly as a composer and putting himself in touch with publishers, with Ataria and particularly in Vienna, so that he can begin to have his works um, appear importantly in print. So it's not just about performance, but it's also about this idea that his music could circulate in the home um, as um, music that could be performed by a wide variety of people, by amateurs and by professionals. He's also, he's also entered into a world where the music is more or less controlled by aristocrats, their, their courts, their houses, their, their groups, they're infatuated by it and, and very knowledgeable about it. And he obviously had to play ball with them he wanted to. Can you give us some idea of his relationship with that? Group? Well, that had already be- begun to build up in Bonn and then extended in Vienna so that he could have these relationships, not really friendships. Um, but sort of strong relationships with aristocratic patrons um, who were willing to support him in his various ventures, who were willing to promote him, who encouraged subscriptions to some of his music when it was printed, and also who would eventually, and this was very important, agree some kind of annual stipend for him, so that in order to keep him in Vienna, as eventually they wanted to do, um, a group of uh, three or four aristocrats um, arranged this system whereby they would support him and give him some money a year so that he would stay within the city. You've emphasised the multiple nature of Vienna's attachment to music, uh, Italian opera uh, uh, and dance music, as it were. Did that? Did, did Beethoven go? Do we know? Did Beethoven go to any of the concerts? Did he listen to any of that? Was it part of his uh, life there? Yes, it was very much part of his life. It was also part of his composing life that I think we tend to forget. Um, Beethoven was relatively unusual in that he could determine the opus numbers of his works, of his publications. But there was a lot of music that was published without an opus number, and a lot of this was the more popular repertoire, so dances, songs, airs, um, arrangements of Italian opera that were very, very important for giving him a popular base within um, the audiences for his music. Um, So really engaging with that kind of side of Viennese musical life. Erika, um, how did he begin to stand out from other composers? That's, he's still in Vienna. He's a young man, 22, 23. He's making his way. He's obviously standing out, as we've been told. How did he go on from there? How did he more than stand out? We've been told they, they gave him a, a salary, or they, they lumped together. So, so it must have got. It must have been pretty good. But we didn't realise, I didn't understand how he got there. Well, his biggest leg up really was being accepted very quickly as a musical genius even before he had actually published any great works or, or produced any great um, compositions, because he came there to study. So he, w- he had his head down and he was working by himself. But in the meantime, getting a reputation in these salons as a great improviser and uh, really the Viennese 
music circle was looking for a new Mozart as well. They were looking for a new superstar on the music scene and Beethoven seemed quite likely to be able to fulfill that. So that by the time he did publish his first major opus, which was his Piano Trio's Opus 1 in 1795, he was basically already recognised as the greatest young musician on the scene. Um, so there was a directory of musicians published in 1796 which described Beethoven as a genius and second only to Haydn, who by then was um, the, acknowledged as the greatest musician um, and he was obviously of an older generation. But Beethoven was really a composer-performer rather than primarily a composer in his early days. So he started producing um, some quite serious keyboard-based works. We have the Piano Trio as Opus 1, the Piano Sonata as Opus 2, and they are um, sort of in the mould of Haydn, but with an extra ingredient of seriousness. So he very much likes his minor keys. Um, they're big, expansive works. They use four movements rather than three, which is normal for a sonata. So that already makes a statement that these are more like symphonies than, than like chamber music. So by the end of the 1790s, he was a genius. He was recognised as a, as a superstar. Was the, was the legacy of Mozart hovering over him all this time? It in, was. in Vienna and in his own mind? Yes, already in Bonn, um, a few people said about him that he could be the next Mozart if he continued in this way. And we have to remember Mozart died only a year before Beethoven arrived in Vienna. And he had also died very young. So he was still a young superstar by the time he died. So that um, post was vacant as it was on the music scene and um, very quickly Beethoven was accepted um, as, as, as stepping into those shoes. Can we just clarify uh, the financial support? He goes there not impoverished but not with much, much money as I understand. He quite soon settles in with, with enough and maybe a little bit, anyway, to enough to live on. How, can you just clarify how he got that? Yes, well, initially he still had a salary from his court position in Bonn because the journey was supposed to be temporary. He was supposed to go and study and then go back to Bonn and fulfil his um, court duties there. But the court disbanded because it was invaded by the French Revolutionary Forces. So, and then his father died. So suddenly there was nothing for him to go back to Bonn for. And uh, that salary um, stopped. But he received a lot of support from aristocrats on the Viennese music scene. A very important aristocrat was Karl Lichnowsky, who supported him very early on. He, for instance, as Laura mentioned, helped support the publication of his first um, works. He also gave him a small salary for a few years, um, not to fulfill any duties, just simply to support him. Um, but really the most extraordinary thing happened in 1809, which is something Laura's already mentioned, when um, the circumstances were that Beethoven had been offered a court position in Kassel um, at the court of Jerome Bonaparte um, uh, uh, as a Kapellmeister there. And Beethoven actually accepted that. He was in king where? in Kassel. Yeah. Um, so he accepted that because he was uh, not badly off, but still having to constantly produce things in order to make a living. So that was getting a bit of a drain. He wanted to, to focus on bigger works. And when the Viennese public learned that he had taken up that position, these aristocrats clubbed together, three of them, and uh, drew up this amazing contract which said we were going to give Beethoven a lifetime salary simply so that he will no longer be embarrassed by the necessities of life and that um, nothing would clog his great genius. So they, they just wanted him to be in Vienna and to compose. So he was recognised as being such an important musical asset to the city that they were willing to give him a salary with, with no expectation in return. And in fact he never left Vienna. No, he, he no. never left, yeah. yeah. So it was kind of by accident that he ended up there, but it, uh, it was a happy accident. But by design on yes. that part that he stayed, yes. yes. John, John Deathridge, can we talk about music without words? And, and mm. did he consciously, he must have done, tell us how he arrived at it and why it was so important to him and why he developed it so dramatically. Well, I think um, my view is that when you came to Vienna in those days, one of the first things you become very aware of as a creative artist um, is the role of the censor. It was a very um, authoritarian kind of society and people say that's one of the reasons the Viennese are so cheerful because they want to escape from these, uh, these, these political pressures for various political reasons. Um, 
um, it became very authoritarian after the reign of Joseph II, who was a very enlightened monarch, and one of Beethoven's heroes. He wrote a cantata while he was still in Bonn, celebrating, uh, if, one, if that is the word, the death of Joseph II. Marking, perhaps. Marking, but also celebrating, because it was a, it was a legacy they all knew was going to go backwards. Um, that's why I mentioned the word. I know it in, seems inappropriate, but the mood of the cantata is not quite just of sadness. This is something that was very special at the time, because yeah, Joseph II was a remarkable ruler who tried to change many things about education, including the function of music. Um, in so let's get back to Mozart and music. Yes, word, well, sorry, I'm digressing. Um, but the the point about music without words, I think was an ambition of Beethoven's because he felt through performance, and this is where the improvisation comes in that Eric has already mentioned. He'd read C.P. Bach's book about performing at the keyboard. You can move people in ways that are not limited by words. He was also going into a place that if you wanted to make money, you were at operas. Um, Mozart had made enough money, well, of course he spent a lot of money too, with operas. Uh, Beethoven thought operas were, oh, that's why he brought in the word censor, because operas were easy to censor, but words without music are quite difficult to get well, at. You, you cannot, you cannot yeah. censor a piano So he didn't trail. do opera, we might come to the one opera later, but he didn't do the opera. But what, how, can you, what can you tell us about how he became more and more intrigued about developing his long, intricate, complicated, and yet popular symphonies. What, yes. what well, attracted him about Well, the, the, the complexity, there's a, there's, you know, there's a certain sort of didacticism about Beethoven, which not everybody likes, that, you know, you have to listen to this, I'm forcing you to listen to this, and this authoritarian thing has got on people's nerves over the period. The other thing is, though, that through abstract music and certainly improvising first of all then putting that in compositional terms you can whip up the feelings of the audience you can take them on emotional journeys there's a very important word in Germany Schwärmerei uh, which is enthusiasm which he got from Christoph Gottlieb Nefer who was into two things virtue and Schwärmerei enthusiasm this idea of th enthusiasm which was a philosophical category actually in the 18th century as well and to you, to communicate that to an audience without the encumbrance of words, uh, Beethoven saw, I think, in ways that Haydn didn't and Mozart didn't always, that you could move audiences in a particular way and, and, and actually impress them and it could reach a lot of people. Laura, um, he's seen... Uh as a bridge between the classical tradition and the romantic tradition. Did he see himself as that? And if he didn't, even so, what, what was he? I'm not so sure that he did. I think, actually, the idea of Beethoven as romantic is more of a critical term than, as a, than a creative one. I think it's something that people began to write um, and use that term around him. So very famously, E.T.A. Hoffmann, in um, 1810, writing about the Fifth Symphony, refers to Beethoven as romantic, and in then he's pulling out this idea that there's a kind of emo emotional maelstrom to his music, that's some kind of idea of inner t turmoil, and connected with this idea of instrumental music, that there's something about that wordless art form which is inherently romantic. But what can you... What does it give you? What does it tell us about it? Let's run with it for a moment or two. Is there anything in it or shall we pass on? There's something very important in it in the way that we now think of Beethoven. It also signals that in some ways he was a transitional figure between what we think of as being the classical period and going into Romanticism. Uh, as is quite often the case with uh, music, there's a sense in which um, it can lag behind literary, literary and philo philosophical movements. It's not necessarily the case that musicians were so terribly up to date with uh, the latest thinking in terms of um, philosophy or literature. However, it was all around um, at the same time and people were beginning to listen to this music because it didn't have words in these quite sophisticated romantic ways. But John mentioned how music could and did move, his music did move people, as music moved people for, for thousands of years, one, yes. one assumes. Um, but did he deliberately use that as a way to communicate beyond the way he'd heard people even hadn't communicated before. Did he say, I can make this more richer than, than literature, richer than painting? Because he was very competitive. 
Well, so, put that to one side. What yeah, do you yeah. think? Yeah. No, I mean, certainly competitive, certainly ambitious and wanting to express perhaps more in music than had been done before. The other thing... What was that? What was, more, mind, what was the more he wanted to express? Um, if you wanted to go down uh, the spiritual route, you might think that there was some sense of the otherworldly that you could hear or might be conveyed within Beethoven's music. There might be something within his personal experience. Without but there words. might, yes, also be an idea of exploring the potential of abstract forms. And one of the ideas that we might pick up from Romanticism is an idea of kind of chaos and complexity. And that's something that, as you look through Beethoven's career, you can certainly see as being the case that that idea of experimentation and the kind of radical um, extension and explosion of um, tradition is something that you might want to um, hear within Beethoven's uh, works and which he might arguably have been exploring within them. Was that noticed, uh, Eric, was that noticed early on? Uh, did he come to it later in his career? Uh, was it? Was he thought of as different because of his attempt, which is his success at complexity and also yet keeping a lot of people engaged? There was a very important turning point um, which leads into what we call Beethoven's middle period, the second period. Um, the first big symphony from that period is Symphony Number no. 3, the Eroica Symphony. So that symphony is almost twice as long as the two previous ones. And um, he knew what he was doing to audiences because in the printed first edition of the parts, he added a note to the first violin saying, um, because the symphony is deliberately a lot longer than is usual, I recommend that it's performed early on in a concert so that the audience is not too tired. So he really wanted his audience to listen carefully. This was not, like you said at the beginning, this was not entertainment music. This was something that had meaning. Um, and from well, what meaning would, did he put into America? People don't know about what. What meaning was he was he trying to? Well, what meaning was in it? As well, far as he was concerned. The very famous story about the. Eroica Symphony is its original intended dedication. Originally, Beethoven wanted to dedicate this work to Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, then he decided he was going to actually name it after Napoleon Bonaparte. And this was in the year 1803 when he composed it. Uh, and then what happened was uh, he heard the news that Napoleon had crowned himself emperor. Rather than being first consul of France, he had now um, taken the crown and he was emperor. And Beethoven apparently was so disillusioned thinking that Napoleon was now just a tyrant like everybody else, that he tore up that dedication. But the print of the idea of Napoleon is still very much in the symphony. And what's that? Well, it's, the, it's actually quite difficult to get to the heart of, and I think that's deliberate. So we have a very um, stormy and very struggle-filled first movement, which really conjures up to listeners the idea of some sort of epic struggle. Uh, some sort of inner turmoil perhaps but there's certainly a sense of heroism there and then we have a second movement which is a funeral march and it's incredibly tragic and incredibly dark uh, which is a lot more extreme than you would expect to have in a piece of instrumental music normally you know what to expect you're going to have a fast movement a slow movement a dance movement but here we have something that's trying to say something more and we the audience are not entirely sure we're not even sure who the great man is that this symphony is supposed to be dedicated to but there's a meaning there that we are invited to try and understand. Is there one meaning or is it, sorry, is there one meaning or is it open to multiple meanings? I think it's very much open to multiple meanings. People have tried to find a definite meaning in that symphony. So people have um, speculated that actually the figure is not Napoleon, but it's Prometheus because the finale uses a theme from Beethoven's ballet Prometheus. And so it's possible to read some sort of narrative in there about the death and resurrection. Um, but I think it's very much uh, many possible meanings. John, <clears throat> on Dethridge, at quite an early age, late 20s, early 30s, he, there begins to be a marked, uh, and you're noticeable, deterioration in his hearing. Mm. Can you tell us about that? And what, and then he wrote this great testament to his brothers, in, in which I, in, in the letter which he never sent to them, in which he said he thought of taking his own life, yeah, what was yes, he to do if he couldn't do music, but he did go on. So can you tell us about the deafness and how that set in? Uh, yes, this is the Heiligenstadt uh, testament. Yes. Uh, he wrote that in a, um, a place just outside Vienna, where he um, uh, tells his brothers, he had two brothers, who came to Vienna after... Bonn, the court at Bonn, was dissolved uh, 
um, in the 1790s by Napoleon. Uh, it's an important little fact, that. Um, and he's telling his brothers, um, I have been having lots of illnesses. Basically, he's saying, I am suffering. And the worst thing is that I have encroaching deafness, which, of course, for any musician is a terrible thing to learn from the doctors. It wasn't actually that bad at the time. But I think the important thing about his trajectory as a composer at this point. He planned his life out in the 1790s to a certain extent with the help of Lishnovsky, but he realised that it was not going to go. What do you mean he planned plan. his life out? Well, he what planned he was going to do this, he was going to do a symphony then, and he was going to gradually make his mark in a certain strategic way. Um, he was very well known, but that's not the same thing as establishing yourself in publication and politically as a composer. But here, he realised that his life was probably going to be different. And I think the thing about this document, which is very important in the Beethoven literature, it's him giving himself a reason for why he he is suffering and he's also by not sending it saying I'm going to I'm not going to commit suicide I'm going to overcome this suffering in a sense that's what the Eroica Symphony is about it's about something that's very problematic in the beginning movement then you have the funeral march and so forth and in the end it's an overcoming of this particular state yes. of mind I would quite like to return to the deafness later on as how does it affect <coughs> affect this comp composition because there's obviously a, a discussion to be had about that yes but if we just move on to get through a few uh, a major p points Laura, the next one I'd like to go to was Fidelio, his opera. What do we learn about him from that? Well, that he struggled in some ways to come up with the kind of perfect final form of this. He was based on a, a French a libretto originally. It was composed in the early 1800s and its first form, interestingly, as um, Leonora, as being based around um, the figure of Fidelio, who's imprisoned and his wife disguises herself to go and rescue him. In some ways, this fits into the idea of kind of uh, French revolutionary opera much more easily than it does into the kind of Viennese tradition, so it's borrowing from outside in terms of its sources. Um, it's a long work. Quite often it's seen as being something that doesn't quite work dramatically. Its first performances um, were also um, slightly stymied by being uh, premiered at the time when Napoleon had first occupied Vienna. He then returns to uh, the opera and revises it and restructures it um, around 1814, 1815, when it becomes um, towards the version of Fidelia that we know today. What did he learn from it, though? He didn't go on to write operas. He seemed to learn not to write more operas. Well, he had other operatic projects in mind that he mm. didn't pursue. I think part of the idea is that actually he established himself as an instrumental composer that he could... Um, work more freely within that realm. The collaborative aspect of opera is always problematic, Can but I it was important for uh, establishing his kind of public figure. Yes. Uh, and it sort of limps slightly, although it's got much magnificence in it. It has slightly limped along uh, ever since, really. I'm before you three, I'm saying that very tentatively, so yeah, I'm going well to move on. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, an it important question you ask people, how many stars would you give Fidelio out of five? No, yes. I wouldn't dream of asking that sort of question, but if you want to ask it, you can answer it well, yourself. I'd give it, I, give, I would give it six, I, uh, but a lot of people only give it two. Six out of five? <laughs> six out of five, yes. I think, we'll leave all I think it's, it's wonderful. Too, it's too difficult. There you are, you see? I'm not so sure about that. So so. You're... you're um, I think there are moments which are fantastic, but actually the kind of dramaturgy of it is not necessarily yeah, As I so said, and I, we all yeah. think the moments are fantastic, yeah. but uh, it doesn't matter what I, I think. I think the thing about Fidelio is people say, you know, Laura's quite rightly said, it comes out of the French Revolutionary phase, but which French Revolution are we talking about yeah. here? Because it's definitely um, has its origins in a play that was performed in Paris after the fall of Robespierre and after the reaction against the terror. So we're talking mm -hmm. here about a more royalist idea of free. Freedom. Before you run away with anything, I think there are good things in it, but I've never enjoyed it much as a complete opera. My opinion is of no consequence whatsoever. That's why I'm turning to oh. Erica. Uh, what we, we um, Laura's mentioned that he concentrated on instrumental works. About this time, what's he, he's working? He's going. F his, his deafness is deteriorating. Um, and is, what sort of instrumentalist work is he doing that he hadn't done before? How is he developing his instrumental work? And uh, so this is around the time of his deafness. Uh, well, he... No, not in terms of his deafness, not yet. What's he doing after Fidelio? What sort of work is he doing? Well, um, 
There are symphonies every so often, so there's a big ten year gap between the seventh and eighth and the ninth. Um, but at various points, he's he's writing piano works. He's still very much a pianist at root. So we have piano sonatas from all stages. Is of he his still career. able to perform despite this encroaching deafness? Um, yes, for a while. So he still was performing in in 1808. He performed the premiere of his fourth piano concerto. So by that time, he was already um, becoming hard of hearing. He performed for the last time in 1814 that we know and at that time in order to have a conversation with Beethoven you had to shout so it, he was struggling to have conversation around that time he started using ear trumpets and by 1818 his hearing had deteriorated so much that he communicated by using conversation books these were pieces of paper or blocks of paper that he carried around so if you wanted to say something to Beethoven you would have to write it down rather than speak and he would speak back um, so by by his final decade, really, he was he was almost totally deaf. So he's making his work more common. Back to you, John. Um, you, the Mrs. Solemnis, is this the work of a religious man or the work of a man who wants to make a work about religion? Um, I think it's both, in a way. Um, one of the problems about Beethoven religion is he never left any document that spells out his religious beliefs. But we do have the Mrs. Solemnis and the Mass in C, his predecessor that's been put in the shade, un, uh, I, I think unjustly, because the Mass in C is also a wonderful Mass. But the, the, the Mrs. Solemnis um, is proof, if any were needed, that uh, Beethoven thought really extremely hard about the whole issue of the deity, the divine, went into each clause of the Mass, did research on it in Archduke Rudolph's library, managed to create a kind of music that's actually not like any Thing else he wrote. It's a very unusual piece. Would you describe um, it as a religious piece? Though? I would describe it as a religious piece. Um, I wouldn't describe it necessarily as a piece you want to hear in church. In fact, you can't do it in church. You cannot conduct this as part of a, a, a mass. You can do the mass in C as part of a church service, but you can't do uh, the Mr. Salemis because it's too big. It goes beyond the church. It goes sort of beyond the divinity. Um, and I think it also. What does that mean? It, well, it, it it wants to it wants to reach further than established Christianity. And uh, I think one of the things about Beethoven, who who believed in the word virtue a lot and the, believed in the idea that humanity still needs to come together. Uh, it's losing its sense of religion. It's the, the age is becoming too secular. You know all those kind of arguments. I think this is one work. Uh, which is not not only musically ambitious and absolutely wonderful, it's supposed to take you out of yourself into realms that you haven't explored in terms of religious feeling. Um, it certainly does. Um, Laura, what do we know about his working method? Well, actually, Eric has already mentioned his use of notebooks in terms of communication. We've already spoken about the way that he was an improviser, and that was important in the way it fed into his compositions. He was also somebody who sketched a great deal. So these could be uh, sketches for works on a kind of conceptual level that would think about the overall structure of it. He's sketching music? Yes. So he's carrying these notebooks and they're full of music? Um, he had workbooks that he made up himself and that he would jot down ideas on, but also he would return to ideas, save ideas, come back and revise. And that could be quite large-scale structural thoughts, but they could also be details. And you could have this sort of sense of the labour of um, producing these scores. We have this sort of extraordinary devotion to Irene, getting up at dawn, working, uh, working, working, working again, then going out for a walk or a walk in the country, which is something he did most days and something he particularly liked. Yes, and something he might have... Kant did something similar, right? I mean, yeah. that idea of having the break within your day yeah. uh, to contemplate. But the sort of romantic image of it is of him going with his notebook and transcribing thoughts as he went. Yeah. Um, so. But it's working, working, working is what we're talking about, really, aren't we? Um, yes, but I think there are also kind of ideas of him socialising, of meeting with people, of being in taverns, of um, maybe not participating in social life as much as he used to in his youth, because in some ways his deafness meant that he didn't um, enter into society as gladly as he had done before. So can we track that a bit further, Eric? Uh, he's, he's, he's going deaf, he's, he's writing more complex works, taking a longer time, he can afford to do so, literally, because of the money coming in. Um, and what sort of life does he have around him? He, he gets involved with several women, he doesn't marry anybody, um, and so on. Can you just make that more literate? Yes, well, the, the classic images of Beethoven being ill-tempered and a bit misanthropic, 
and uh, that is fair to some extent and it's partly due to his deafness it's something he recognized in himself and mentioned even in the Heiligenstadt Testament so he he says people see me as a man hater but no one understands what I'm going through um, but actually even before uh, there were signs of his going deaf he was already um, known for his slightly fiery temperament there are stories of aristocrats in these salons literally begging him to play and him refusing you know he had this slightly haughty temperament which was part I think of his persona as an artist as well particularly in the salons as an improviser um, but yes you mentioned he, n he never married but he did fall in love, love several times he proposed twice was turned down and um, the first time because he was so ugly apparently and half crazy and the second time we, we don't know why but he was falling in love with women who were out of his league a lot of the time so he was this was still a very hierarchical society so there wasn't really any way that he was realistically going to marry above his station but he fell in love with a lot of his um, aristocratic piano students for instance it was tempting to see that as deliberate that he's perhaps uh, looking for an excuse not to uh, not for not to be able to marry but uh, certainly in his final years, he was very much an established bachelor and he, he stopped looking for There was one woman he fell in love with and wrote a letter to. We don't know her name, but this, right. she was the one. Yes, uh, these now notorious letters he wrote to an immortal beloved. This was in the year 1812. And uh, he seems to have been very much in love with this woman and they were thinking of um, building a life together. But by the end of these three letters, it's established that they are going to have to live apart and never be together. And that seems to have been the turning point for him that after that point, he was uh, a bachelor and uh, no longer looked for, for that kind of relationship. Yes, uh, this is a, I think this is an important subject, the letter to the immortal beloved. I think it's absolutely wonderful that we don't know who the woman's name is, but books have been written about you know, who it is. What There's an obsession with this letter. It was also like the Heiligenstadt Testament, never sent, apparently. Um, it was found in a drawer after Beethoven's death. But it is another letter, really, about suffering and about how you know, I, I'm never really going to get the woman I want and I think it, yes, it's, yeah. it, 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 it's, it, it's like the, it's, it's almost giving a reason of why he's feeling the way he is Can I ask you, it's very difficult and if there, if there isn't time to give a proper and a reasonable answer, let's forget it Is there any way of tracking the influence of his deafness on his music because he became increasingly 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 deaf and the music became increasingly increasingly complex and long, is there any correlation between that? I think that's very difficult to determine. Um, a lot of people have said the certain way he orchestrates the Seventh Symphony, for example, shows that he was there, but I, I, do, I do think that's very hard to prove. Goethe was the one who, uh, who he met in Taplitz. This is the time when he wrote the letter to the immortal beloved and actually said, um, I like Beethoven. They almost met uh, over a period of weeks or every day and said his deaf he is to be pitied because his deafness means for him a social encumbrance which is very hard for him to take so socially he's at his behavior changed uh, Richard Wagner had an interesting theory about this he said his deafness actually made him think more about the relationship between the practicalities of music and how one thinks about it on paper ideally before anybody's performed it and it somehow loosened the inhibition that one might have had so he could actually write things on paper and his deafness allowed him to escape from that kind of restriction but I think that's rather a fanciful theory as well. His own cork like cork lined room in his head mm. really. Laura, um, it said that Beethoven changed the way in music the way music was performed and was received how did he do that? If you bear in mind actually how some of his first works were premiered it gives us an insight into what he was responding to. So if you think about a concert that happened on the 22nd December uh, 1809, this was a cold winter's night, it lasted four and a half hours, it included the Sixth Symphony, a concert aria, uh, movements from the Mass in C, sung in German, the premiere of the Fifth Symphony and the choral fantasy. <laughs> um, that kind of concert was not unusual in Vienna at the time. The idea of mixing sacred works, instrumental works, symphonies, concert arias, the idea of kind of specialising and beginning to listen to uh, music in a kind of more dedicated way um, was something that was built into the way in which he started to think about quartets and some of these, in fact, he even said, this music is so complex, it's not really for public consumption. 
This is music that you have to put the work into to get something out of. He was also struggling against... But the interesting thing is that the place was full. Mm. So it's, yes. it's not, not only what he's doing, it's how it is being received. It is very complicated. People are saying, I don't understand that, but it's great, and I'm going tomorrow night as well. Yes, but the other thing to bear in mind is actually the kind of performance preparation culture was also very different. So you were listening to things that had been done on one rehearsal, or even the Concert Spirituel were done as playthroughs in the afternoon. So the idea of hearing a polished performance, which is what we're used to today, is also uh, not around in quite the same way. So the idea that you have to work on learning to play these quartets, that they're get, then going to be perform to a group of connoisseurs and appreciated as such is important and in a way by writing such complicated music he's demanding a different kind of attention from listeners Erica um, is it possible to summarise his impact on classical music over the last uh, century and a half, two centuries is it? Well he, he was a huge influence on later 19th century composers of instrumental music and particularly in the symphonies um, Laura started talking about some of the quartets and some of the more experimental things he was doing in the smaller forms. In some ways, those were less influential because they were so far out that people didn't quite know where to go after that. But the symphonies, he really um, transformed the symphony into something that was much more of a big narrative, something that you have to listen to with attention. So the idea that there's a, a long trajectory over the course of the whole work is something that he did marvellously in, in works like the Fifth Symphony, which has this whole trajectory of struggle and overcoming and final victory. And that sort of set the standard for large-scale musical forms for the rest of the 19th century and, and beyond into the 20th. John, briefly, I'm afraid. Um, I think Beethoven established the idea that music was the best way of conveying the idea of suffering and sorrow which you can overcome. It's the idea of enthusiasm in the face of, 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 of ad adversity and also about freedom, freedom that we don't have yet, which is one reason, I think, why Be Beethoven is still a modern composer, people feel. I mean, it's, modern. It's, a, it's a kind of state in music we haven't reached yet. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura Tunbridge, John Dethridge, um, Erica Burnham. I usually say, what did I miss out? But there's so much that I missed out that I'm not going to say that this time. What would you like to continue to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> I would like to talk some more about the, the very late works and the, the quartets in particular, because I think something that's so amazing about them is that Beethoven was really writing so far ahead of his time. There, there wasn't an obvious audience or even performer base that was going to take up this amazing repertoire. I'm we have found that some of them were performed in Vienna though. Oh, they were, they were, but so, they yeah. were, they were And quite enthusiastic because the musicians loved salaries. playing it and they, you know, they, 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 they thought these late works were absolutely fascinating. The audience is a different matter. Yeah. And I think it is important to give the performance their due. So someone like Schapanzig and the role he played in promoting but also being prepared to learn this music and perform it was important as well. We didn't develop the idea that there'd been very few rehearsals until then, and you had That's to true. rehearse Beethoven's music. So well, you, you you brought it up, but we didn't develop it quite, did we? That yes. You had to rehearse that. So I mean, the idea that you basically have the kind of one rehearsal, full rehearsal, maybe a second rehearsal if you're lucky, but basically then the performance is what it is. Mm. So this idea that now we have, where you have, well, hopefully quite a lot of rehearsal, or at least the idea of a kind of polished performance, um, is not really present in quite the same way. It's beginning to build up, mostly in these kind of smaller forms about chamber music. Um, and also, we don't have the kind of conductor playing a similar role that they do today. So the idea of the kind of conductor grandstanding at the front mm. of the orchestra is also not a figure who's present uh, within the Viennese concert scene in the same way. So there are lots of kind of significant changes happening within Beethoven's time. But but it has become conductor's music. It has very much become um, conductor's music. And, uh, yeah. Beethoven insisted on doing it himself, but he often got the beat wrong, and so it all collapsed. Yeah. Uh, one thing I'd, I think um, is important is the global reach of Beethoven, because he is tremendously successful in China mm -hmm. and in Japan, um, all over the world. Why is that? I mean, is it? Well, you tell me. Why is, is it? Is it something to do? What kind of message is the, is the music? Something like the Ninth Symphony, some of these big works. Um, I think. If you know, this idea of putting a name to suffering and overcoming suffering and you know, eating bitterness, as they say in China, is very attractive to um, 
the Chinese mine has been put as one of the reasons for his success there. Roman Rolland, you know, who was big on this, was translated into Chinese. Uh, he wrote this book called Beethoven, the Creator in the 1920s, which is one of the best books on Beethoven, in my view. Um, and that got very well known in China. And in Japan, this idea of the big nine, you know, where whole cities can, Osaka every year has practically the whole town singing the Ninth Symphony. This, this idea of, of of largeness of community is something that uh, this music has has uh, you know has, has locked into in these countries. Yeah, but it's interesting contrasting that monumentality with nineteenth century practices, where, for instance, the finale of the Ninth Symphony that is so celebrated now wasn't thought to be so successful, so quite often wasn't performed when they perform the Ninth Symphony. Yeah, I, I, yes, so that's true. A, I mean, I'm thinking though of you know because the the, the the perception of it has changed, and people, you know, Leonard Bernstein puts the word freedom in the last movement of the fall, yeah. which is completely inauthentic, but of course it feels right, and for the Chinese on this scale, and you know, when the Japanese, um, where was it in the uh, Olympic Games in 1998, Osaka conducted. 2,000 people performing the Ninth Symphony at the end of the games and that was l linked into Cape Town, uh, Beijing, um, Sydney, Australia uh, because they'd got over the digital delay so the, the, the sort of the, all the cities were singing the Ninth Symphony in, in Japan it's the most extraordinary idea and Beethoven you know, turning in his grave perhaps but you know this, this, is, this is what the kind of mentality is he's encouraged. Uh, and of course, Beethoven's reach is not just global, it actually goes extraterrestrial because I think there's two different Beethoven works on that golden disc which has been sent out into space. So Beethoven has been chosen as representative of of music yes, on Earth, of, which is an amazing of statement. Of music, <laughs> yes. yes. And of course he went laterally as well. Intergalactic. The famous, the famous roll over Beethoven. Exactly, yes. 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 So that idea of the artist whose life is important as well is also significant. Mm. Uh, the kind of composer where we spend all our time wondering about his biography and how it connects to his music mm. has also proved hugely influential. Yes, I'd love to know how Chuck Berry came on, onto that title. I mean, the idea of rolling over Beethoven. Yeah. I suppose that's what we're doing here, really. Give Tchaikovsky the news, yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tchaikovsky, of course, wasn't it very? Uh, yes, they all were. I must they, they, they all were had they, Beethoven were looking over. Influenced or intimidated? Yeah, they were, he was looking over their shoulder. <laughs> Brahms yeah. said the same thing as Tchaikovsky. You know, I've got Ludwig here. Hello, Ludwig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me try and write a. Did he, did he up the game for everybody because of? Yes, what, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yes, yeah. including Wagner. Yeah, and I think it is that taking music seriously and the kind of abstract music or whatever, any kind of music, elevating it is what kind of raised the game. Yeah. And also points. going one better. How, yeah. I mean, how how do you trump the Ninth Symphony? Mm. Uh, you see, the Mrs. Solemnis is more difficult uh, to trump because not everybody was into writing masses, mm. but symphonies, it's very public genre. I think it becomes a competitive game where you know, not all composers win, I have but to say. But Wagner, to a certain extent, I know this is elliptical and sort of demotic in a way, in a way he sort of picked up where Beethoven left off. He, did, he, he thought, I can carry this forward. Is there anything in that? Yes, yeah. Mm. That's, but, that's true, I think. But how you do that, of course, yeah. formally and, and yeah. musically, is a, is, a, is a big problem for Schumann, Mendelssohn. Schumann's idea was to actually shrink the size of the symphony, uh, to, do, to do things on a more, you know, a, 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 a novelette basis rather mm. than a big novel in sound. It's funny you should say he's rejected because he's ugly, because one of you said, I think it was you, John, in, you know, in the notes, no, there's all these portraits and... Each one is different from what, the other, so you don't know what yeah. they look like. But yeah. he was notorious for uh, being quite negligent about his appearance. Uh, in fact, you mean he didn't wash and stuff? Well, he washed a lot, but he didn't <laughs> tend to tidy his appearance very much. So his his clothes were quite shabby, and in fact, in the 1820s, he once was mistaken for a tramp and was arrested. And the the police officer wouldn't believe that he was Beethoven. He said, "Yeah, sure you are." Um, and they had to get a local musician to come and identify him because he was, yeah, he'd gone out without a hat and then he got lost. So he was just mistaken for. Yeah, well, you don't know what Beethoven. Like. You don't know who the immortal beloved is. You don't know who Elise is. For Elise, you know, the thing that everybody plays. Like, you don't know who's Elise. There have been lots of guesses, but there's yeah. no proof who it is. I was intrigued by the fact that he was born the same year as Wordsworth, and there's a lot you don't know. But ah. the two. Doesn't, don't, we needn't go further with that, but it's just a little tiny yes. thing, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you all. Did you enjoy that?
Yes, yeah, thank you very much. Very, very nice. Simon's coming in with an offer you're not allowed to refuse. I'll tea your coffee. We've got some Vienna Wazari if you want. Tea, <laughs> <laughs> tea your coffee, who'd like that? I like a coffee, I'd please. I'd like a coffee, coffee please. please. Three coffees, Mother. I like a black coffee, please. Yes, thank you.